You're listening to Paris Search Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. Paris Search Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch Radio. And a very good Wednesday evening to you all. This is Penny G. Morgan of Haunted Histories, bringing you our regular dose of history and the paranormal. Last week, we looked at the Ragged School in East London, and we were joined by the lovely Kerry and Steve of Fright Nights London. I say this every week, but I do generally mean it. If you've had any experiences of the places that we have covered or are going to cover, please don't think twice about letting me know. I'm always looking to talk about what other people have seen and felt. This isn't just my show, you know. I don't mind sharing the airwaves a little bit. A little bit, anyway. Well, as we're only a few hours away from the 1st of June, I thought I would mention the show's Haunted Histories have got planned for the next month. We'll be looking at Mill Life in the north, We'll be looking at Newsham Park Orphanage in Liverpool. Maybe even get to touch on the Newsham ghost pick that was recently taken. And if you haven't read about that, look it up because the gentleman who took it is actually going to be on the show. Kelverden Hatch, the not-so-secret nuclear bunker in Essex. And St Thomas's Hospital in London. All of these will be with some really great special guests to give us their stories and experiences of the places. So you're not just going to have to listen to me ramble on for 60 minutes, you lucky people. It's a pretty diverse list of shows, I'm sure you will agree. We'll just wait and see what we've got lined up for, what we've got lined up, sorry, for July and August. Should whet your appetite for history and the paranormal quite a bit. I'm actually going to be doing a spot of investigating myself this week. I'm getting to visit the new tavern fort in Kent with a group called Ghost Hunter Tours. We may have to chat about that at some point too. This place itself doesn't get investigated very often. Um, My friend went there on a historical tour the other day, uh, sort of during the day tour between 12 and 4. Um, And she was taking some videos of some of the sort of tunnels and corridors that she was walking around in. And at one of them, about three seconds in, there was a very distinct growl noise. Now, if you've ever been to one of these forts and you can see how thick walls are because they were there to protect the ammunition and everything else that was in them it's unlikely it would have been sound from above ground but she didn't even hear it as she was videoing she didn't hear it until she played it back but it's very very there so really looking forward to this week and what experiences i'm going to have when i'm at this fort in kent anyway back to today where are we well if you do actually read the show description Thank you very much. We work very hard on those. You should know. We've gone even further north than we went when we went to Ripon. We've gone to Scotland. And more specifically, Mary King's Close in Edinburgh. Now, I'm not sure what you think of when someone mentions Edinburgh. Possibly the amazing but quite eerie castle on top of the hill. Maybe Scottish rugby. It is the home to Murrayfield rugby ground after all. In fact, when I asked my husband what Edinburgh conjures up for him thought-wise, rugby was the only thing he could think of. I think he even said kilts as well, but I think that was just being facetious. Possibly it could be as the home to the Scottish Parliament in Holyrood. Me? I think of the underground town underneath the city. The vaults. The place where supposedly the killers Burke and Hare stored the bodies before selling them to Dr Knox for dissection at his anatomy classes. Burke and Hare, 
Oh, I'm going to digress a bit. That's an interesting tale in itself. Whether they did really use these vaults to store the bodies, we don't really know for sure, but it would certainly be plausible. But Burke, from County Tyrone originally in Ireland, was hung for his part in the murders. Hare, also an Irishman, from they're not sure where in the records, whether it's Armagh or Londonderry, was actually pardoned. And no one really knows what happened to him once he went south of the border into England. I think it was before the days where you were given a new identity, but I guess crimes of Scotland didn't go as far as south of the border. The irony of this case, which I found quite interesting, was that Burke's body, the guy who was hung, was actually used for dissection after his public hanging, hanging attended by in excess of 20,000 people, and with tickets reputedly sold for space at the various surrounding tenement buildings. The professor, who was in charge of the dissection, actually had to call the police due to the amount of people who were clamouring to get in to watch it. I believe they ended up coming to an agreement saying that people could file in 50 at a time to see the body. The whole saga of Burke and Hare actually created a new term in Edinburgh, burking, meaning to smother or suffocate. In fact, a rhyme was chanted around the city. Now, I'm not going to try and do this with a Scottish accent as I don't want to embarrass myself more than I do without even trying, but up the close and down the stair, button Ben with Burke and Hare. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, knocks the boy that buys the beef. Kind of sums up what they did, really. But I'm not going to talk about the vaults. Nope, as they're likely to be a subject of a show at some point in the future. They're just far too interesting and full of stories to cover in one paragraph. But with my fascination with history and things that sort of may unnerve people, the vaults and Mary King's Close are definitely the things that I associate with Edinburgh. Now, to understand more about this area, we have to go back about 400 years or so to 17th century Edinburgh. At this time, Edinburgh Old Town was suffering major overcrowding issues. The city walls, which had been erected to protect its residents, was actually stopping the city from expanding. So, to meet demand for housing, more and more and more houses and buildings were being crammed into existing small spaces and they were starting to build up as opposed to out higher than 14 stories in some places. The poor would live on the lower levels where the stench of sewage was at its worst and the light probably didn't even reach living a dark, smelly, dank existence, whereas the richer and better off would live higher up. Um, but whilst during all these changes to the city, most closes were demolished to be built into something else. Now, when you think of close, a close, don't think of what we'd expect as being a little row with 30 or 40 houses on it. The closes in Edinburgh weren't like that. They were almost like little enclaves of their own, with lots of little alleyways and buildings, offshoots and everything else. So when these closes were being demolished to make way for more, I suppose, suitable accommodation, Mary King's Close survived. Albeit, it got built over. The new Royal Mile was completed by taking off some of the higher floors of the original buildings and using the remaining floors as foundations. I would guess not many people would have wanted to stay, but some did, quite a few by all accounts, carrying on their daily activities in this weird, semi-enclosed, dark underground world. Supposedly it was the place to go if you wanted your knives sharpening or um, a new wig building. I do remember when I went on a a sort of day tour around Edinburgh once that they pointed out these multi-storey tenement areas and asked what we thought that they would do with the um, um, waste products as there was no sewage system. They also mentioned that if we ever heard someone shout Gardy Lou to whatever we did and not look up to where the person was actually shouting and to try and either stand in the middle of the footpath or go for shelter as it meant someone was entering, emptying whatever device they had used to well. Um, I'm sure you actually know what I'm talking about here and I'm not going to, I don't have to explain it to you lovely people any further but uh, it actually came from the French Gardy Lou meaning basically watch out for water or something similar to that. But with over 50,000 people living in a very small area, with livestock wandering about, and narrow 
cramped alleyways. The stench and stink was probably absolutely phenomenal. In fact, I think Edinburgh was even known as the stinky town. Mary King Close is actually hidden below Edinburgh Council's city chambers. Now, anyway. But you can visit, and there are some amazing tours available. And whilst when it was covered over in the mid-1600s it caused people to leave, there was no concept of the devastation that would happen um, in 1645 with the arrival of the plague. To say it decimated Edinburgh and its surrounding sort of areas is probably an understatement. It, it killed over half the population believe they believe in Edinburgh alone um, and the city rulers for want of a better term were completely thrown as to what to do to halt this devastation from this this abhorrent disease that was killing off people of working age children you name it do you know how the bubonic plague works what it does. Do you know why it's known as the Black Death? Well, firstly, the symptoms come on very fast after contracting it. Chills, a general feeling of being unwell, quite a high temperature, um, possibly even seizures, and then swellings. Each swelling is called a bubo, hence bubonic plague. Commonly, these swellings were in the groin, but they were also around the bite site, because... As we know, this wasn't something that was carried in the air. Then these poor individuals would develop gangrene of the extremities, giving the illusion of black, hence black death, as the tissue suffered from necrosis. Most of us have probably learned as school children that it was rats that spread the disease. Well, not actually the rats itself. They were just the carriers. It was fleas, a specific type of flea, that lived on the rats. But back then they didn't realise this. Um, and we're gonna we'll probably talk about um the plague masks and something in a bit because that's quite an interesting subject. Whilst doing my research into Mary King's Close and Underground Edinburgh and all those kind of things, I discovered a really, really excellent book by a writer called J. A. Henderson, who also incidentally does tours around the more spookier areas, I suppose you could say, of Edinburgh, called the City of Dead Tours. The book, which is called The Town Below Ground, is an excellent description of all that was going on beneath people's feet in Edinburgh over the years. And if you're interested in history, then I would recommend this book. No, I'm not on commission. Well, that would be nice. But I have used it heavily in my research into this specific subject. So it only seems fair to mention it to you all. It's not a boring historical read either. It's quite, it's quite an easy read, albeit an intelligent, easy read. And it covers all the vaults, it covers Mary King's Close, all those kind of things. It's very good. It's well worth downloading onto your Kindle or even buying a hardback or paperback version if it's the kind of area that you're interested in. So, back to Mary King's Close. If you remember, I described it as being dark, dank, cramped, people hemmed in, small rooms with lots of people living in them, very unsanitary living conditions. Pretty much a perfect breeding ground for rats, and more specifically, the Black Death. And it was just this, so when the plague arrived in Edinburgh in 1645, the closes supposedly reported to have suffered very, very badly. The epidemic itself was causing mass panic amongst city officials, so their solution was to contain what they perceived to be the problem. They're reported to have bricked the area up. In fact, they're reported to have bricked up any area where they thought it could contain the problem. In Henderson's book, he mentions them sealing up a nursery with all the children still inside the building. The mothers, all at work, supposedly discovered what had happened and ran to the nursery with food, water, blankets, etc. to be with their offspring. Once they were allowed in, they were walled up there too. 
I don't know if any of this is true. Um, it does sound logical because it's what they did in Mary King's Close, but when you start looking at some of the other things that they did during that time when the plague was hitting with a vengeance, it does seem a bit of a callous way of going about it. But the history sources do vary. And it is a story that they like telling, that that's why Mary King's Close is so reportedly haunted. Back then, um, they believed that the plague was passed on via the air. You'll hear Andy Mercer, my special guest in the second half, and I talking about it, the miasma. You've probably seen those grotesque plague masks that they use for carnivals and for dressing up. They almost look like a, something from a, a horror story prop. Ever wondered why they were designed with that weird protruding beak of a nose? Well, it's because that part was actually filled with herbs that the wearers and medical experts at the time believed would stop the evil smells, which they thought carried the plague from getting to them. So these herbs would smell sweet, so therefore the bad smell that the plague was part of wouldn't be able to get to them because they were smelling the nice sweet herbs. A pretty useless measure we know now. But that was then. That was 400 years ago. It wasn't now with the scientific discoveries we have. The first um, plague doctor of Edinburgh was a gentleman by the name of John Paulicius, who died of the plague in June 1645 after only a very, very short time in the job. A very large salary was promised to the second plague doctor in Edinburgh, one George Ray. Now, Dr. Ray was a lot more successful. He lived. It didn't kill him. He wore the plague mask, as all plague doctors and people working with people with the plague did, the one with the large beaky nose full of herbs that I mentioned earlier. But he also wore a big leather coat, cloak. He was covered in leather clothing, apparently. The treatment they felt for the plague was to... And I'm sorry if you have a nervous disposition. If you are, you may want, want to listen to this bit because it's gross. They would burst open those swellings, the buboes of victims, and then sterilise the wound with a hot poker. Bear in mind, however, that there was no anaesthetics available in Edinburgh, no antibiotics. So people would have probably died from the plague anyway, even if they hadn't had or hadn't done these, I don't know, minor surgical procedures. And the ones that didn't die from the plague possibly would have died from infection or just the shock and the pain of it. Um, it probably wouldn't have been the most comfortable of an experience. But interestingly enough, Edinburgh Council are a little bit cheeky. They never intended to pay this massive salary which was promised to, to Dr Ray as the plague doctor was never expected to survive so therefore was never expected to actually ask for their money. It's known that Ray pursued Edinburgh's town council for some time for the money but the general feeling it was very unlikely that it was ever paid to him. So was Ray just lucky that he never contracted the plague himself? Or is there something else afoot? Well, historians actually think it was the leather cloak he wore. It would have been heavy enough to protect against the flea bites getting to his skin therefore protecting him from the illness um, and protecting him from the, the cause of the illness although most people probably thought he was just lucky and he was a miracle doctor back then or, or he had the god with him or something but no he was covered in a big leather cloak and that's probably what saved him so the close they bricked it up supposedly sealed every single person in there to die to try and prevent the further spread of this epidemic can't imagine what that must have been like especially as there would have been whole families there would have been children not knowing what was going on and just having their normal day-to-day -day activities at this point cities such as edinburgh had introduced people called foul clangers who had the possibly unenviable job of taking the plague victims away from the city boundaries and to burn their clothes and even their property at times but I guess with somewhere such as Mary King's Close, which was so cramped and slum-like, this would not have been possible. So imprisonment may have been the better option. 
It did get cleared out at the end, though, once the plague had abated, but there probably wouldn't have been any survivors if the bricking up option is true. With around half the population of Edinburgh dying, the death toll in nearby Leith was even higher. Believed to be, because Leith is a dock, it's a port area, all the ships that were frequently coming in were probably carrying even more rats and horrible things like that. The actual effect on society and industry in Scotland at that time, especially that part of Scotland, was actually devastating. If you think, if it killed off over half, at least half the population in Edinburgh, it killed off over half in nearby Leith. Now, the populations themselves back then weren't what we would expect now in the millions. You're looking at 40,000, 50,000 people. Half of those have been killed, died. So you've got less and less able-bodied people to do, well, to take up arms. It would have been the um, way of assessing whether they were capable or not. So with less people to do the day-to-day -day jobs, running the farms, working factories, or whatever sort of systems they would have had back then, um, the wages went up for those who were still alive. And many industries struggled to continue. And obviously prices went up for everything else that was around. It was a really... It was, it was more than just the devastation of the death, so it was a massive knock-on. Then you had the plague pits. Most people have heard of plague pits. There's tales that in London, some of the major parks that people play on and enjoy themselves on are actually, well, designed over old plague pits. To cope with the, the number of bodies and the need to get them off the streets, and as they felt, to try and contain the infection, these pits were hastily dug at places like Bermuir, which basically is a Scottish word for moor, to the south of the city, and Lee Links, near Leith, the docks area of Edinburgh. Today there's a few physical reminders of the plague epidemics that swept through the city, but a tombstone in, the garden, in a garden sorry, at Greenhill, a stone's throw away from Brunsfield Links, bears the name of John Livingston and his wife Elizabeth Rigg, who succumbed to the plague, albeit not in Mary King's Close, in 1645. The bodies that were buried here, historically, golfers would tee off over them because a lot of the links are actual very, very old and respected golf courses. But then again, if you've ever played golf or been around golfers, you'll know that nothing really stops them from playing when they're determined to do so. Rain, shine, lightning, playing over plague pits, no, if they want a good game of golf, it ain't going to stop them, is it? But it's quite an eerie thought, really. But even after the plague had abated, the close stayed closed, and as the years went on, the legends and tales around the place got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the, the sort of um, illusion that it was a place of death and foreboding just kept growing. People were moved back into the close sometime after, um, but only a few were prepared to take the risk of being what they thought would be attacked by spirits that were still meant to linger. In fact, the city officials were so desperate to get people to move in that some properties were offered completely for free. And there's only a few brave souls who stayed there more than a very short time, and even they reported to see things that they couldn't explain. A scary but interesting fact about the bubonic plague... We probably associate it with the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. But the last recorded epidemic in a British city was actually in Glasgow in 1900. Something like 36, 37 cases were reported, with 16 of them sadly dying. The slum conditions, which were still very much in existence then, bred the perfect conditions again for this deadly disease. So Mary King's close? Well, it finally shut its doors to residents in 1902. A gentleman by the name of Andrew Chesney was forced out due to compulsory purchase. And whilst there were sporadic tours in the late 20th century, it wasn't until 2003 that it was opened to the public as a tourist attraction. Makes you wonder what kind of things were going on in there while it was sealed up. In the second half, I'm going to be talking to my friend and para-search colleague, Andy Mercer, because he was one of the first sort of groups to go in there when they reopened it in the late 20th century, and we can hear about some of his thoughts and feelings about the place. But what I do want you to consider, though, is that this close isn't the only one in Edinburgh 
there's meant to be quite a few that have lain undiscovered beneath the city streets. And it does make you wonder what kind of secrets they hold. But anyway, here's a quick word from our friend and sponsor, Mr. Harry Price. Hello, Harry Price here. Good evening. If there's nothing myself and everybody else enjoy here on the other side more is the sit back and relax and listen to Parasearch Radio with its paranormal news, views and reviews from across the UK and beyond. Make sure to find out more about them on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web, whatever they are, to keep up to date with all their broadcasts throughout the week. And I hope you enjoy them as much as we do over here. Hello? Is anybody there? And hello everybody, we're back from the break. I hope you've had a chance to have a drink or get one ready so that you can carry on listening to this fascinating show on Mary King's Close. I'm joined now by my good friend and co-presenter at Parasearch, Mr Andy Mercer. Hello Andy. Hello, how are you doing this evening? I'm very well, thank you. How are Excellent, you? Sir. Yeah, not too bad at all. Yeah, pretty good. Good, good. Well, Andy has um, been in the paranormal sort of environment, I suppose you could say, for, for how long mm-hmm. now? Um, about 30 years, and it's quite sad, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. And what made you get into it in the first place, Andy? Well, I mean, that's quite a long story in itself. I mean, um, I had a We've very got half an hour experience. to fill, mate. You know, fill, fill oh, your boots. Fine. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, a couple of things. Really. I had an early experience when I was about 10 years old visiting a local, um, they said, disused fort that was built in the First World War and built more in the Second World War called Coal House Fort. Yes, and in Til- the place Tilbury. Was really... In Tilbury, Sega? Essex. It's Tilbury, that's the Essex, that's isn't one. it? Yeah. Yeah. That's the place. It's um, just on the coast. And back in the sort of when I was there in the 70s, it was closed down. It was actually barricaded off. You couldn't get inside. But there were lots of gaps in the fence. It was fairly easy to break into. And it's part of a country park. So we were there. I used to go there often on a Sunday afternoon, just sort of sit and you know, just relax with my parents, obviously, and grandparents at the time. And we'd often break into the fort because there's a large open area in the middle of the fort where you could um, basically play football and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I was in there with my brother and some other kids and we were just sort of basically playing football. I remember looking up at one point, not up sort of straight, but kind of a bit further away, and there's just like a pair of legs of two men walking past about 15, 20 feet away. And they were dressed really strangely. They were kind of dressed in like a light brown kind of khaki uniform. And the thing that really stuck, my, stuck in my mind was they were kind of bandaging almost like round the lower heart of their legs. And they just sort of walked past. There were no real voices or sound, but they were solid. They were like two ordinary men dressed in some kind of uniform hmm. walking from like one side to another corner and then I, I kind of remember looking away and looking back and they weren't there anymore and it was only years later or sometime later, I kind of figured out it was the first world war uniform they're wearing hence the kind of the yeah. band if you like effect around the lower heart of their legs and um, I don't it was one of these odd things I knew there was something strange about it but it didn't really say to anybody else no one else had noticed them but I definitely was very sure what I'd seen walk past and it just stuck with me and I actually remember saying to one of my parents that I'd seen these men inside the fort and they said what oh, don't be tough there's no one in there and what are you doing in there anyway you shouldn't be mm. in there so that was, I was about 10 years old when that happened, 10, 11 years old. And that kind of stuck me for many years. And I got looking at books and reading about ghosts and that kind of stuff. And fast forward a little bit to the early, or oh, mid 1980s, sort of towards the end, 88, I think it was, 87, 88, a local writer called Andy Collins had published a book called The Black Alchemist, mm-hmm. which was all about his um, experiences and adventures, basically dealing with this guy called The Black Alchemist. It was like a true life um, mystery adventure involving the paranormal and the supernatural. And he and Wood Bernard had retrieved a number of artefacts that had been hidden in locations around the southeast in churchyards, etc., causing idea was causing an effect to the atmosphere. And they'd removed the items and the atmosphere had been kind of cleaned up. And he gave a talk about this um, Black Alchemist adventure, having published the book, and had with him some of the artefacts that were retrieved from the sites. And at the end of the talk, it was only about 30 people, there, 20, 30 people, and he let us handle the artefacts. And I remember holding one in particular, and it was, it was like holding a live battery. It's anyone can describe it. You could absolutely feel the energy. Literally, you could feel it like it was holding a live battery, as I say. It was yeah. like 
power running through this thing. And I thought, bloody hell, what is this? And Andy ran at the time a group called Earth Quest, used to meet once a month in the pub in um, Leon C upstairs to have talks and discussions and um, meditation groups and go out and investigate things in the landscape, you know, things like crop circles, all that kind of stuff. Not that I believe in those now, but, you know, he was interested at the time. So I got involved with the Andy's groups. And so I have had the two as an abiding interest for many years of, Primary, I suppose, I would say the esoteric and the occult has been my main interest. Mm. But it knocks on easily into into the paranormal. So yeah. I've been on many, many, many investigations over the years or different parts of the country in the UK. So yeah, that's kind of how I got into it in my background, really. Okay. So what what's been your favourite place to investigate? Well, I'd have to be honest and say the most favoured of mine is also the place I've been to the most number of times would be a place called Woodchester Mansion over in Gloucestershire. It's um, a pretty amazing building. It was uh, built in the mid-Victorian age but was never finished. All right. The, the rumour is that some strange thing happened to the workmen and they all ran away. And the truth was, actually, the guy having it built uh, ran out of money. And he both <laughs> paid for the workers and he paid for all the tours. So they just downed tours and left because he couldn't afford to pay them anymore. Living with a builder? That still happens now. <laughs> <laughs> not, not good, really, is it? Not good at all. But basically what happened was the guy was originally in the slave trade and he moved to um, basically growing... I think it was, it was either cotton or sugar. I think it might have been sugar. And apparently there was a major storm which wiped out much of his crop, so, of course, he had no money. Yeah. The guy's name was William Lee. That was it. Those are guys having Woodchester Mansion built. So it was left sort of half-finished. So it's effectively a Victorian building site. But it's, again, a fascinating building. It's got all sorts of strange stories and history to it. It was used during the Second World War as a training camp for the D-Day landings. There's a, a oh. lake nearby that was used to test the pontoon bridges and the story goes that one of the bridges collapsed and several people were killed or dragged underwater by a heavy tank that sank because of the, the bridge had collapsed. Yeah. In the very possibly, again in the 80s, that kind of time frame, it was probably was used for some kind of ritual magic by some local group. The building itself includes a small chapel that was never consecrated, never finished. But it's set out as a chapel, and it was believed that that was being used. Things were reported being seen. People taking their dogs for the walk in nearby valley had seen things like fires clearly burning inside and remains of candles and candle wax was discovered and that sort of thing to suggest activity had taken place in the 80s. Briefly, um, an old tramp lived there for a while, I think, but no one's really lived there for any period of time. So it, it's a fascinating building. And where so, is it? It's in Gloucestershire. All it's right. near a village called Nymphsfield. It's... Stroud is probably the closest town, probably about 15, okay. 20 miles, something along those lines. I'm not entirely sure, but it's literally mm. middle of nowhere. Yeah. So that's a fascinating location. Um, that's probably my favourite, mainly because I've been there so many times. Right. I've, you know, I've, one of the things I've been involved in over the years is the various um, professional panel groups, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the event groups you can pay to go along to. And I worked with Fright Nights for a number of years, and we were there virtually every weekend for quite a period of time. So I was there more than 50 times just with Fright Nights, let alone other occasions and investigations I was involved in. So it is a fascinating place. That would be probably my favourite, the one I'd like to get back to that I've not been to for a long time. But also a very nice area, of course, is Edinburgh. which um, I It is. It, anyone topic. would think you've done this before, Andy. Oh, no. Never done this before. <laughs> I'm quite impressed. We're nearly nine minutes in and you and I haven't argued about anything yet. Do you think oh, no. do it will make it through the whole 30 minutes? I doubt it. What do you reckon? No, I, th I think there's going to be I'm, a I bit think of a will. dispute. I think it'll be fine. You, no, think? Fine. you think? Yeah. Oh, well, I don't think anyone will believe us who sat in a car with us that we'll manage to get through <laughs> half an hour without having a, a, a quite a sort of disagree well, a dis dis disagreement, a thing of a, what do they call it, a difference of opinion about Alternate something. Point of view. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's what makes the world go round. Wouldn't want to all be the same, would we? Um, yes, so Edinburgh. Um, as I yes. mentioned in my first half, I, I did say to a few people, what does Edinburgh conjure up for you? And most of them would say the castle. My husband said Murrayfield, the rugby ground. Um, uh -huh. You can tell what we watch when it's on. Um, for me, it is the underground city, for want of a mm. better term, even though it's not on a par with probably the... Um, the catacombs under Paris and everything because you can't sort of just wander around the whole thing with the vaults and all of that mm. and when you look into why a lot of the closes um, and and winds as they are also known the roads are also known why they're actually underground it's quite fascinating really that it was literally just built over mm. um, using the, the original sort of 
buildings up to a certain level as the foundations and also to make it level so you didn't have the undulation of a lot of these places mm. but the one that does everyone does know about even though there's other ones which apparently are hidden and people can't get to them even though if you look at the architectural sort of, or the um, uh, historical architectural maps of Edinburgh you can see there's quite a few of these closes and winds that have been bricked mm. over the accessible one is Mary King's Close Mm-hmm. Um, and also because of its whether it's true or not, nobody really knows. But the 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 the, the story that there was over three hundred plague victims bricked up in mm. it does give rise to quite a lot of good ghost stories. For one, for absolutely. Better term. I do know other people who've investigated there. Um, before we start talking about your investigations there, um, one of them, she mm -hmm. told me I wasn't allowed to mention them because she didn't want a certain part of her anatomy to be made famous, but I'm going to mention it anyway. <laughs> she <laughs> she said when she was there, she felt someone slap her backside, turned round to see if it was her husband larking about, and there was no one near her. Uh -huh. but she said she definitely felt it. Um, and if she's listening to this, she, she's probably going to be swearing at me, but I didn't mention your <laughs> name, Paula. <laughs> um, he shouldn't tell me stories like that and then tell me I can't use it but that's what she felt when she was there now okay. when I went up to Edinburgh I went into the vaults but I didn't actually go into Mary King's Close I can't remember why there was a reason but you have on a couple of occasions haven't you Yes, we are, uh, again, early on in its sort of life as a haunted location to be investigated. Our good old Fright Nights were very good at opening the doors to places not being covered before, and I think it may well have been the first, at least one of the first few that ever took place there, and it was absolutely fascinating place. As you say, it's quite rightly, it's um, essentially an underground city or a small town. It's yep. literally been cut off and built on top of them. As you said, they used the buildings underneath as the foundation for the buildings on top. So, yeah, it was a very strange location, certainly. So how would you describe it to someone who's never been in there, going well, into going into Mary King's Close? As you come down, obviously, through the kind of the modern bit, the visitor's area, you go down quite a steep slope down into, and as you look down, you're, like, you're looking down into a Victorian high street, but with just the physical brick buildings. There. There's no, obviously, the usual kind of stuff's missing. It's just literally the, the stone buildings that were there have been all that remains, but you are literally walking into it. And they put some props up there. I remember there was, like, washing hanging up and this little old curtains of the windows, but they're just modern bits that have been added mm. to the attraction. But the buildings themselves, they are literally like it's been sheared off the top and you go first coming it's quite a steep drop downwards and you do feel it gets colder as you go down yes. so you in fact you walk into a man-made cave quite literally and that's really what it felt like it's um right. quite strange just that entrance into it you do feel you really are slipping back in time right definitely right and how 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 could, how big is it down there how would you so how much space is there as you're walking through these sort of alleys because when i think of a close i think of almost like a modern day close like a tiny mm. little road with say 20 or 30 houses that's what we think but that's not what closes are or were no in edinburgh not that. they were sort it was of offshoots of things and everything else so h how much space is there i mean you're six foot plus mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if i'm right if i remember rightly so yeah, yeah. how how claustrophobic did it feel well, interesting, not quite, because a lot of them are missing their roofs as you get further down. So right. it's fairly open. But you, when you go into some of the, the houses, as would-be houses, they were absolutely tiny. Mm. You know, not much bigger than your average bathrooms. So, and that was like a, a proper main room of the house. So they were quite small. But because everything's open, there's no doors and there's no windows. Oh, the windows. There's nothing in the windows as such. So it, it's quite open in that respect. But you do feel... You feel the atmosphere. It feels claustrophobic in a different way, not not visually claustrophobic or in terms of space, but just the, the atmosphere down there, the feeling that you have. I mean, the main walkway from memory is about 100 yards or so, and you've got, got small buildings on either side that um, are essentially homes, as, as would have been. Most of them are on single floor. Some of them may have had one or two, of a, like a second floor, to, but predominantly they were just single floor buildings. So each one you could walk into and walk around quite easily. Uh, but there are other bits further down. I can remember there was a section that seemed to be dedicated to some young girl who had been... Um, the ghost was believed to occupy the area. Annie. Annie. That's the one, yeah, mm. yeah. And there was a little display to her. I remember that she used to, used to bring gifts and presents and leave them behind there. You meant, so. She's meant to be one of the, the more prolific ghosts mm. there. She, it was a little 10-year-old girl supposedly called Annie who That's... appeared 
supposedly from what I've read to a Japanese psychic who was down there and from in the 90s and from then on people have always bought little gifts and stuff to leave mm -hmm. for this little girl who was bricked up so if the legend is true in the close with either yeah. she suffered from the plague or her family did I'm not sure which but yeah Annie Annie the 10 year old that's the one mm. yeah yeah no, it was um, I remember seeing that um, and there's literally hundreds of things have been left there left there for her but I mean that jumping ahead too much that was the strongest impression I got was there was definitely children present in there so your friend slapped the backside maybe would have been one of the kids actually mucking about that the slap backside I wasn't supposed to talk about so it didn't yeah, I? yeah that one yeah yeah <laughs> Yes, that's definitely the one. But yeah, that that could well have been one of those children ones that that definitely you had the feeling were down there. That was um, something I was quite aware of, certainly. But it was um, again, the, the full night was interesting. As I say, we had a few experiences. There was about twenty, twenty five of us in the group. It was, it was one of those. It was part of a whole weekend of different locations we were investigating. Mm -hmm. But it was probably the higher it was was the close itself. It definitely had a very interesting atmosphere to it, certainly. Okay, so. Talk to me about some of the experiences that you had down there. Sure, yeah. Well, I'd say predominantly the feeling was of children running around and sort of making noise. You can't, you didn't necessarily hear it, but you just kind of felt that that was going on. In some of the rooms, there was definitely a feeling of heaviness, a kind of a feeling that they knew they were trapped and were in trouble, that they were, they were in and they weren't coming out again. So you, you get a kind of that combination probably of young kids who wouldn't have known they were in any kind of danger, just mm. a bit of fun. Um, and the adults were very, very aware that all was not well. Yeah. Quite literally, because it was the plague, but not well as in they probably were never going to come out of this place. And you did get that sense of heaviness. Yeah. There was a couple of times when we did have some small seances. You broke into smaller groups. We did try a little sort of circle seance thing. And there was the weirdest smell. It really was strange. It's really hard to describe. It's kind of sickly sweet, but just odd and it suggested perhaps it was some kind of effect from decay if you like because of the plague victims were, were suffering and it was really hard to describe it was a very strange so not something i've ever noticed before it was um or in any other location just yeah. this kind of weird sickly sweet smell like sometimes you get sweet food that's decaying it's really hard it's hard to explain on the radio what the smell was like <laughs> Well, the plague doctors themselves, with those weird, bul you know, the bulbous nose masks, mm. they'd fill the nose full of mm. sweet-smelling herbs because they believed that the plague was carried on the air. So, oh, yes. therefore, if if you were smelling something other than the air, you would be okay. So it could mm. be that, or it could have been an effect of the gangrene from the plague because that's meant that, to that smell a bit one. weird as well, isn't it? It's meant yeah, to have a weird. That was it. It was that sickly sweet smell. I would go for the latter, being most yeah. likely to have been that it was that kind of decay smell. The, um, as you say, the theory on those days was what they called the miasma, the bad smells, was the mm. cause of carrying of illness or disease. And yes, it's one of those images, isn't it, that the plague doctor with the long yeah. kind of beat thing that has almost become that kind of gothic horror image that yeah. seems prevalent. And not surprisingly, people thought they on one or two occasions thought they saw just such a figure lurking in the depths of the close because it was um it was lit but low lighting low as yeah. in not very right not low to the ground but low as in sort of dim yellowy light yeah. in some parts which of course added to the atmosphere enormously but a few people did say they'd seen that kind of figure uh, wandering around down there i didn't see anything myself but there was you know on a second um little sort of seance stop if you like we had the definite feeling of someone was walking around the group around us mm -hmm. that was quite a strong feeling that a few people picked up upon so again whether it was a plague doctor or one of the children or something heavier as in dark or unpleasant it was nothing you would sort of say it was an evil presence or anything like that i think no demons then no demons down no, there, no, Andy. No, no. no? no? You sure? You sure? You none, none of these children were masquerading as de were actually demons masquerading as children. No big horns, right? Because we know we know how we feel about every bad thing is a demon. <laughs> we Absolutely. know how we feel about that. We actually agree on that one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, American audience, if you love your demons, there was none down there. Just yeah. very unhappy people. Sad yeah, and un unsurprisingly, if they've all been bricked in to die, even if they didn't actually have the the illness at the time mm. so you, you conducted these seances did anyone come through in the seances um, or was it more a sort of a, a, a watching 
sort of feeling yes. than that. There was more of that kind of awareness of presences around us. I mean, it was definitely sounds of like stones being thrown and taps on the wall, but you know, it's difficult to be sure when you've got buildings that are kind of, it was dusty, there were sort of stones lying around, so mm. someone's feet moving, or you know, or it could be someone was paranormal was throwing stones around, you couldn't really tell, but there was definitely noises around us, there's no two, two ways about that. Inexplicable but there were noises. Of, yeah, well, it seemed that possibly difficult to identify, but you couldn't be certain because, as I say, it was dusty and there were other groups, other parts of our groups were there yeah. that we tried to make sure we were reasonably far apart so we didn't interrupt each other at all in terms of yeah. noise. But at the end of the day, you're underground. It's not that uh, big, so you're not going to be able to completely escape each other's sounds. But it was the overall impression of the atmosphere itself, how the place felt was mm-hmm. more than anything. Else. It did have, and it wasn't just because you knew of its reason it was the way it was. It did have a heaviness to it that you could feel, where people obviously had to felt very sad and mournful. And if you're a believer in sort of stone tape type theory, the building mm. would have been saturated with that kind of negative energy mm. the, uh, and happiness. Now, I tend to go on the idea that it might be the EM field itself that's around you that's carrying that kind of heaviness, like a negative charge of energy that's in the atmosphere. But how and would that negative charge have started? Did that make sense? People, yeah, the people. Negative in the terms of doom and gloom. And right. Kind of dark and heavy, as in, you know, we ain't having a good time down here. This is, this is no party place. This is a bad place to be. And that kind of ominousness. And um, funny enough, we were talking earlier on about another place that has a similar atmosphere, which people might be able to relate to, and that's um, Kelvin and Hatch Nuclear Bunker. Yeah. Again, nothing nothing sinister necessarily happened down there. Don't but we it know is of. Got, <laughs> Yeah, well, this is it. We don't know, obviously, its full history, but certainly the impression is it was just generally used as it was as a, as a military base in preparation for nuclear war. But because yeah. you know that's why it's there, you're there, working there, that's a heavy feeling. And the knowledge that this place is a whole reason to exist is because of nu- possibly nuclear war. So that can give you a kind of heaviness. And I think that's penetrated into that building. And I think it penetrated into the Gary King's Close. You know that you once you're in here, you ain't coming out. You know, you, you, your time is limited. There's a virulent, nasty disease that there's no cure for. And it's all around you. If you haven't got it yet, you're going to get it. Mm. You know, the chance that you're not going to survive. And I'm, I'd imagine that's really what happened down there. Again, the, the full history is not that well known. I remember rightly, it was much like the Edinburgh vaults themselves, they were lost for years. Yeah. They knew they were there, but they weren't quite sure whereabouts it was. Well, supposedly with the vaults, it was a rugby player who discovered them in about 1980. Oh, he was okay. exploring, from what I've read. But with with Mary King's, um, the last resident left there in about 1902. Yes. Um, and then it was sealed up. And it was mm-hmm. only, I think it was when they they were doing something to the chambers, the council chambers, they discovered an entry point into it uh-huh. so um it, it that that's you know that's why they believe there's quite a lot of these closes and winds mm-hmm. ar- around edinburgh that have just been have been built over probably yeah. not dissimilar actually to tube tunnels if i'm completely honest in london because a lot of mm-hmm. tube tunnels were places that were just built over to create that tube tunnel as opposed to digging down mm-hmm. and there's so many of those that are disused from sort of the, the Victorian and the early 1900s. There's probably mm. loads of those as well that nobody knows they exist, and um, or someone does somewhere, but doesn't talk about it. So mm-hmm. I th- there's probably I mean, a lot of these kind of things around. Not absolutely. quite the same as Edinburgh because it is quite unique in the the the, sh- the underground streets, for want of a better mm. word, that were created. Um, but for those who don't know what stone tape theory is that you just mentioned, do you want to explain that? Okay. Yeah, sure. I'd be amazed if they don't know, because it's probably one of the most prevalent theories about it. The essence of the idea is that the building or environment in which people are in cord the events around, we call the atmosphere, or call particular events, occurrences, and violent actions, etc., that penetrate into the building work itself, and under certain circumstances, the building replays the events, a bit like a, a videotape records on, I mean, to me, old-fashioned videotapes, but back in the day of videotapes, where they had a piece of... <laughs> Are we talking tape. VHS or Beta here? <laughs> Those guys, the other ones, yeah. Anyone under 40 is probably thinking, what the hell are they talking about? But, yeah, the idea of those pieces of metal, uh, metal tape, basically, that was recording the imagery onto it, that under certain circumstances, i.e. putting in a video player, you can watch the imagery again. Essentially, the same kind of thing as a digital phone today would record onto mm. a memory card, and the memory card itself contains the imagery of the events, and in the right circumstances, i.e. plug into your computer, you can watch them all again. Mm-hmm. And that's that's one of the theories. I, my own take is slightly 
quite a, a bit of a variation that it's not so much the stone building or the place you're in, but the electromagnetic field that, of course, are absolutely everywhere, that they are acting like a recorder, that they're trapping and capturing strong emotional events. And that, again, under certain circumstances, after interacting with that EM field, which you're essentially standing in, then you start to see and experience some of those past historic events. Yeah. And that's the manifestations of a ghost. That's, again, that's sort of a variation on that theory that I tend to go down the road of it being the field. Because, I mean, a good example would be what just a mansion, to go back to the place I mentioned before. That's the, at least the third building on the same site. The previous building, Spring House, was slightly larger. And a description of one of the supposed ghosts that's been seen there is that of a woman in white, appears to be ascending a staircase, but she's walking oddly on the stairs because she's walking on the stairs that was there before which is yeah. in a similar space to the ones where witchesses are now but not exactly the same yeah. so the fact that she appears to walk slightly strange is because she's walking on the old stairs now if it's stone take through the building's not there anymore so it has to be something other than the physical building it's one of the first ones that kind of occurred to me back in god knows 2000 that there might be an alternative theory here yeah and again my experience is working with the esoteric you know we we do cause atmospheres to change by what we do mentally. I mean, you yeah. know that you've seen it happening yourself. And the one was in um, Clapham Wood. Yes, so that was a weird one, actually, that one. <laughs> well, wait till we didn't do enough of an investigation. But um, <laughs> you can manipulate energy around you. I'm no doubt about that at all. And again, events can cause impressions. Now, they don't necessarily have to be big dramatic things. You know, day-to-day -day life of young kids running around in someone like um, Mary King's clothes who wouldn't have known why they were there but then their impressions are left behind so yeah. <clears throat> that's my own thinking of that and what we experienced was mainly that kind of replay event the idea of the kids running around but again some interactivity people sensing of being touched and being pushed and pulled etc but again slightly sceptical hat on you can never be sure that of course it's not just your body reacting because you know our bodies muscles spasm and react in small yeah. scale all the time and we most time we take no notice of it mm. but if you're in the right environment of course you're going to start noticing things so mm. there's always that as a possibility but certainly the feeling that the groups that i was with had because i was one of the organizers if you like i, I was sw sw switching around different groups during yeah. the night and they're all coming back with the same kind of impression that there was definitely movement around them. Nothing specific, nothing you could put your finger on, but there was definitely a sense of being movement around us. So, yeah, it was absolutely a fascinating place. That was the, the first time I was there. The second time was a little bit later on in the year, or maybe the following year, and it was, I had to say, a lot quieter. Again, mm. you could never know why. I think, mm. going back to the theory of talking about EM fields and the, our interaction with it, I think it does often depend on the people that were there. The feeling was the first group that came were much more up for it than the second group. And sometimes they, uh, if the people on the event kind of sit back and wait for the hosts to do things, to make things happen and rely on us to be the, the energy generator, if you like, then it tends to fall a bit flat. But if you get people actively involved, then you tend to get more activity. So you can, rather than the place being let down, sometimes the people you're with, unfortunately, um, don't contribute enough in terms of their engagement with the event for it to become particularly active. But yeah. it was, on both occasions, there was definitely that sense of it being a heavy, oppressive atmosphere, a bit of doom and gloom. So, yeah. a happy place. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the, if the myths are true about what happened to the people who were in there, you can't really blame them for being anything but a bit down on it. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's somewhere I'd have chosen to live when they tried to reopen it sort of 50, 60 years later and they were basically paying people to live there as opposed to people paying to live there. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think you'd have had to been a pretty pretty brave person to want to live somewhere where all those plague victims were meant to have died. But then again, when you look at where the plague pits were in Edinburgh, yeah. you've got people living over them, playing golf over them, kids' parks and everything else. So mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's sometimes a case of if you don't know what's beneath your feet, you probably wouldn't think twice about it. But, well, exactly. Um, yeah. Any, anyway, that's been very interesting, Andy. Thank you ever so much. No problem um, at all. It's somewhere I'd like to visit myself one day if I ever get to mm. go further north, but... Um, my diary's going to get pretty full with all the places I want to visit at the moment and maybe do another <laughs> yeah. show on when I've visited them. But as for yourself, what have you got coming up? 
Well, uh, at the moment, I'm actually working on putting together a publishing company, which I have to mention earlier, um, called Mysterium Press, which we're reproducing some of the old classic grimoires. They're um, oh. the books of magic that go back from, they claim go back to ancient Israel of King Solomon. They're really they're mainly medieval pu- publications. But at the moment, you can either spend a small fortune on some rather nice leather bound old edition published years ago that cost you two, three, four hundred pounds, or you can pay next to nothing for bloody awful um, print on demand paperbacks that are usually badly set and look pretty dreadful. So my idea is aiming to produce nice quality cloth band editions for a reasonable price that people can use if they want to practice magic or just have something in their library. So Mysterium Press will be launching fairly soon with a few titles already sort of coming down the pipeline. And it's um that's what i wanted to do for a number of years it just never really kind of got round to it and just kind of felt no now's the time to do it um, and later on this year which i'll be mentioning to death on any show i'm involved in i'm in, involved in a conference called the nameless art which is about traditional witchcraft in britain this is proper traditional british witchcraft not, so not, not wicca not wicca no, no, yeah. no. <laughs> and um I'm see i do f- listen i do listen to what you tell me Oh, excellent. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm one of the five speakers there. There's also a woman called Gemma Gary who runs our own publishing company called Troy Books and is a prolific writer in the area. A good friend of mine, Richard Ward, who's interested in various aspects of magic, but he's also working his own book on Essex witchcraft and will be out eventually. A chap named Martin Duffy who's written on traditional witchcraft and a chap called Michael Clark who is what um, is termed a cunning man who is a, a practitioner of... Um, kind of anti-witchcraft if you like in, in one one sense it's um, the person you would turn to if you have trouble with witches okay <laughs> so, and he's been involved in that for a number of years and he's um, actually working his own book as well and he's one of our speakers too so it's all people talking about proper traditional witchcraft now you have just very brief three kinds you mentioned the witch which is almost like a modern religion these days. You have yeah. traditional witchcraft, which is modern traditional witchcraft, which is the the antithesis, if you like, for Wicca. But there's also traditional traditional witchcraft, which is actually based on real historic documents. Now, I've actually written a book, which is called The Wicked Shell Decay, which is coming out by um, Three Hands Press, an American publisher, hopefully later this year, possibly early next year now, which is a collection of genuine spells, charms, and incantations from Victorian Britain. And the Folklore Society was the main sort of body that produced books and uh, um, essays on those sort of areas and a lot of these books uh, tell you tales of ghosts of course as well as um, mm-hmm. sort of devils turning up and witches and all this kind of stuff but some of them used to contain genuine examples of cunning craft work and charms and spells of magic that were just recorded in these books and no one's ever thought to compile a book of all the various examples of these spells and charms before and I thought well, that would be an interesting thing to work on and um, say Three Hands Press, the publishers absolutely love the idea so they were publishing my book by later on which is why I'm, I'm part of this name of this art conference in September so, so if anyone be- wants tickets to this conference Andy how do they go about getting them? Very easily. If you go on to Facebook and put in the nameless art, now art is A R T E with an E on the end, you can find the Facebook page. The conference itself is in South End, a place called the Barrymoral Centre, in Westleaf, I should say, (laughs) in South End. And that's on the 2nd of September from 10 in the morning to 5 in the evening. And then in the evening, we're doing a little local tour of an area in um, Hadley and Leon Sea, which is where a chap called Cunning Murrell used to live. Now, Cunning Murrell is a fascinating guy. He is a proper, genuine, um, cunning man from the sort of mid to late Victorian era. And he is probably the originator of a lot of the so-called legends and stories that were attributed to another guy called George Pickingill. Now, George Pickingill, if anyone's into Wicca, would have heard of him because he is one of the the sort of forerunners before a guy called Gerald Gardiner, who founded the Wicca movement, and Gardiner claimed that some of the ideas came from Picking Gill, that's all linked together. Um, actually, that's not true. There's a bit of a story behind that. But that's something we can get into another time when we have a bit more time to talk about it. So they can go to the Facebook page, grab a ticket. Mm-hmm. It's not just a conference. You get a tour as well at the end. Yeah. Loads of information and chance to ask lots of questions about the different types of witchcraft and oh, absolutely. why traditional witchcraft people hate wicker and all that kind of stuff <laughs> that's what i hate i have a, I have a, I have a difference of opinion on it really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i remember what you said to me when i was talking about wicker um okay so well thank you ever so much for your time andy no um, i'm sure we'll chat again about something else seeing as you're on the same station as me and um you've mm. got that's sort of 30 odd years of experience um 
I'm sure if I end up doing a show on something like Jack the Ripper or reported hauntings of Jack the Ripper, I'll be chatting to you as I know you're also a Ripperologist. Oh, yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, it's it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Andy. Um, that just leaves me to say to everyone, thank you for listening. I, I hope you have a good evening, sleep tight, and don't worry about things that go bump in the night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.